You'll grow into it. I don't know if you've ever had somebody tell you that. If you've been a kid, you have. That's what my parents used to say whenever I got a big pair of pants or some clothes as a gift. I'd open that birthday box, and of course you're hoping for some toys or some other thing, and out you'd pull those pants or that shirt, and there the waistband had several inches of space. Now, this is kind of a fond memory for me. I don't really remember having lots of uh, space in my pants, you know, for them to uh, expand out like that. It's not really the problem I have these days. But back then, as a kid, I, whenever I put on pants, they always seemed to be too big, and they'd kind of bunch up at the bottom, and you'd put on a shirt, and your hands would be lost underneath the sleeves and that sort of thing. And, and the parents at that point would say to you those words, ah, you'll grow into it. And you'd realize that whether it was shoes or pants or shirts or whatever else, that there was a growth process. The parents knew that. As a kid, I don't know that I always believed them completely. But you know what? They were right. I did grow into it. In some ways, I even outgrew some things. And I remember a great scene from a movie I saw several years ago. And it was a teenage son, and he was there with his dad, and he was preparing for prom night. And he was wearing his father's suit there. It was the only one he had, and it was really big and baggy all around. And the young man there looked in the mirror, and he kind of frowned, and his father came up behind him and said, hey, don't worry, you'll grow into it. And the son said, by tonight. <laughs> and see, thinking about that, sometimes the pace of growth can be very frustrating. Spiritual growth, well, physical growth, of course, every kid wants to grow a little faster than they do. And maybe in some way spiritual growth can be a frustration to us in our own life and maybe in the lives of others. That's especially when it's frustrating. Sometimes we'll look on at somebody else and say, why are they growing so slow? You know, why is it taking so long for them to grow into this thing? And one of the things that I want to kind of put into our minds to consider tonight is that grace picks up the pace. Grace will pick up the pace of growth in your life. It's really the only thing that leads to growth. The same grace of God that gives us spiritual birth gives us spiritual growth. It's the only way really to grow. But it'll really pick up the pace. And the great thing about God's grace is that we can cooperate with God. See, that's one of the things that the scriptures make so clear. Sometimes it talks about the fact that, hey, it's really all of God, right? At the end of the day, it's all about God. But hey, at the same time, we can co-labor with him. We can cooperate with him, or we can push against his plan in our lives. So part of what we want to talk about tonight in Ephesians chapter 4 is how we can maybe pick up the pace of growth in our own life. And the real key there is surrendering to the Spirit, walking according to God's Word. And Ephesians 4 is all about growing into it. You're going to grow into it. That's really what Ephesians 4 is all about. Into what? Well, the character of Christ. See, as you think about it, that analogy is often used in Scripture that God has a, a garment that he's given us as a gift, a free gift, really, salvation. Hey, and it's big. It's huge. Clothed in Christ, the Bible says we are, and wrapped in the robe of his righteousness. And we've talked about some of those things already in Romans, and we'll talk about it even more. But that garment there of God's grace is big, enormous, and God gave us that salvation as a free gift. And it comes with that glorious parental promise that maybe we've heard in other contexts. Hey, you're going to grow into it. Trust me, you'll grow into it. Now, Ephesians 4, verse 1, this is what it says. It's Paul speaking, and he says, I, therefore, the prisoner of the Lord, beseech you to walk worthy of the calling with which you were called. Now, stopping right there in verse 1, I want to draw your attention to those two words there, walk worthy. That's part of what we'll talk about tonight. And right away, we can know that that's not a self-effort because we can't be worthy of grace. By definition, what is grace? Grace is the undeserved, unearned favor of God. So there's no way that you could really earn something that's unearned or deserve something that's undeserved. So God's grace, well, it's the very thing that allows us to walk worthy. So anytime God commands us something, he's going to enable us to do it. And so that's what we're seeing there of him saying, walk worthy. If you're a Christian, if you have faith tonight in God, if you are a saved person, then you have received God's grace as a gift, a free gift, something you didn't deserve. 
And here in verse 1, Paul the Apostle, well, he's kind of Motown in a way because he ain't too proud to beg. Even though he's a, an apostle, he says, I beseech you. That's a w fancy word for I'm begging. Beg you to walk worthy. Now, worthy of what? You see it there in verse 1, the calling in which you were called. The first three chapters of Ephesians, though, of course, we don't have time to go into it tonight. It has described our calling, the high calling in Christ. And it's great because you'll see the parallel with Romans. See, Paul did this in all of his letters. What he first did is he established the foundation of faith. And then upon that, he would build a life. He did it always first things first. He didn't just kind of come out and say, here's what you need to be doing. And here's how your life needs to change. No, he first of all said, it's got to be built on the foundation of Christ. It's got to be there. And so he would always establish that foundation. And every single one of his letters has that same pattern. It's what Paul does. He first establishes the truth, and then he helps us to build upon it, build our lives upon it. And so the first three chapters of Ephesians, if you look at it later, it is all about the high and heavenly calling that God has called us to. And then as he calls us to those heavenly heights, well, he brings us back, back to earth in a sense and says, okay, now here's what that's going to look like. Here's how that's going to play out. And so Ephesians 1, verse 3, if you just can flip back and kind of look at it there quickly, you'll see Ephesians 1, verse 3, God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places with Christ. And you say, all right, that's great. And just a quick synopsis of some of the blessings that he's talking about there when he says every spiritual blessing, I'll just use some words thrown out here. It's that we've been adopted, that we've been accepted, that we've been redeemed and forgiven, that we're heaven-bound and saved, sealed and made alive, brought back from spiritual death. We are God's workmanship. Those are the things that Paul goes on at length in the first three chapters about, being reconciled and recreated in Christ and all that. And you say, wow, that's amazing. And when we go through Romans chapter 5 with Pastor Pedro, I trust next week, well, he will talk much more about some of those words and some of those things because, again, there's a lot of parallels between them. But remember that God has given us all these things by grace. We weren't worthy of them. We can't be. But he's given us his family name. See, I don't know if you hold that in some honor, whatever your family name is, but as a parent, you really don't want your kids in some way to disgrace the family name, you know, to be your name well known. I have kind of an unusual last name, and Pedro likes to call it Launch with Clonch Ministries because that's my last name, Clonch. But he likes to, uh, to, to do that. But I think about the last name there, that I, I kind of don't want you to know that name because my son went out and did something so horrible that now everyone in the world knows that last name. That would not be a good thing, would it? And so anytime you get the family name, well, that's what God is doing. He's saying, you're Christian. I'm calling you by the name of my son. You are now my son, my daughter, my child. And you know what? That is a high and honorable calling. It's something that we should be very pleased to be Christians, called Christians. And you know what? Those are big shoes to fill, aren't they? You think about it, Christian, it means Christian, Christ, Christ. It's a little Christ. It's like, hey, one who's going to grow into it. And Paul says, you know what? I'm begging you, little guys here. I beg you. I plead with you. As one of you, he says, let's walk worthy. Let's live up to those things. Let's grow into the calling with which we were called. And the word worthy there literally means with equal weight. Now, picturing that, the whole idea is in those days, the way a scale worked, it wasn't like as we're trying to figure out if we're growing into it or growing out of it or whatever. Well, sometimes we'll step on a scale, you know, and it's all digital and all that sort of thing today. But in those days, they had a weight on this side and a weight on that side. And if it was equal in weight, then it would balance out. It would be worthy. That's the word that they're talking about there. And so on the one side is our calling in Christ. And he's just spent three chapters talking about how amazing it is. And then he says, now on the other side is our conduct. We can't ignore that. We can't say, oh, that's really not part of the process, is it? No, that's what he's saying. Your calling and your conduct, at some point, they begin to balance out. That's part of the process of God's grace. That's what God is wanting to do in our lives. If we've been called by his name, Christ's name, there's a point where God is wanting to bring Christ's nature to our life also. I think of this example. When she was young, there was a lady named uh, Victoria. 
And she was shielded from the fact intentionally that she would one day grow up to be the queen of England, the ruling monarch. She didn't know that as a little child there. Now, if you knew that, maybe at too young an age, it might spoil you a little bit. And so there came a point where her teachers began to believe that it was time for her to know what it was that was in her future. And so they gave her this news. You know, when you grow up, this is what you're going to be. This is who you are. And her response was interesting at that point. When she found out the news, she said, then I will be good. Then I will be good. And what she was saying there is from this day on, I'm going to begin to walk worthy of that high calling that I have. When I realize all of the blessings that God has given me in my life and the calling of myself as a Christian, well, that is a high calling. And again, is it that I'll be good in my own strength? No, of course not. The scriptures say that will always be a dismal failure. But when we are willing, God will give us the strength and the ability to do what he has called us to do. So we'll grow into that role and that responsibility. That's our response to God's ability there. And so you are, if you don't already know, a very privileged person as a Christian, not because you're worthy, but because God is good, because he is graceful, because he's given that gift to us. And with that privilege comes the great response and responsibility of growing into that. And God's going to be there every step of that process. See, some Christians get the idea there that being a child of the king, maybe you've heard that, had somebody say, hey, I'm a child of the king, you know. And they think that translates into two different words. Walk wealthy. I'm a child of the king. Walk wealthy. You know, I should be having the best of all things. But, you know, it really here says if you're a child of the king, you're going to walk worthy. And maybe that's a much different thing, a, a different kind of net worth maybe than the financial things. Not maybe living in always the lap of luxury, but certainly living in the lap of the Lord as he puts us on his lap as a parent and says, hey, I'm going to teach and train you along the way. See, Ephesians 4 makes it real clear that being a king's kid here, it's to live a life of love. It's to grow into the character of Christ. That's really what we're to grow into. And so that's why Paul is pleading there. He's not saying, hey, I force you to do this. No, it's a choice that we face. And he's pleading there, by God's grace, hey, avail yourself of it. You're a child of the king. You're royalty. Live up to that, that high calling. And he says, you've been seated in the heavenly places with Christ. Now walk worthy. See, isn't that interesting? He says, you've been seated, but now walk worthy. And you think about that, there's a progression to that, right? Kids, when they learn, they don't just walk right away. The first thing they do is, well, they lay there. That's the first thing they do. They do a lot of that. And then eventually, they really want to sit up. I don't know if you've ever noticed a kid. They really want to do it. And it, at first, they don't know how to sit up without falling over. And so if you're a parent, you kind of stand behind them because they'll do this incredible uh, kind of backflip thing that smacks their head. And so you have to be there for them all the time. But you know what? They sit and then they begin to, they begin to walk. And hey, there comes a point where you can't slow them down. And so he's saying here, walk worthy. And if you've ever seen a toddler walk, I kind of enjoy the process. I think it's a lot of fun to watch a little kid walk. And they have that kind of wobbly look. You know what I'm talking about, where it's like every step is a step of faith. And, uh, you know, you're watching them, and, and they're always on the brink of falling. I mean, it's like this weird process by which they're just a weird gyroscope going on and inside, and their brain's going 100 miles an hour trying to keep them vertical. And you think about that, they've got shock, they've got delight on their face, they've almost got this look of, I can't believe this is happening, I'm walking. And you know what's interesting is that parents don't yell at them when they fall, do they? They don't say, what's the matter with you? Walk worthy of the calling, you know, or whatever. <laughs> but hey, there's a point where walking worthy is just one step, one little step maybe is walking worthy in your life right now. Maybe just one little thing that the Lord is calling you to do, and it'll be a wobbly little step, and you'll have a shocked look on your face as you do it. But maybe God's saying, hey, you need to forgive that person. Whoa, wobble, wobble, wobble. And he says, no, you're going to walk worthy in that, and I'll be right here. And if you blow it, guess what? You know, parents are there taking pictures of, of the process, and they're just basically saying, hey, come to me. You ever done that with a kid? Hey, 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 right here. You know, they take one little step and we're ready to celebrate and see God is like that as a parent he has that 
encouragement for us here in, F in Ephesians. You'll grow into it, he's saying. Just come to me. I, I promise. I'll be there with you every step of the way. And I'm really glad that the book of Ephesians didn't stop here and just say, hey, walk worthy. In Jesus' name, amen. You know, and Paul says, love Paul, and that's the end. No, he's very practical, and I like that in the scriptures. The scriptures are practical, very practical, sometimes painfully practical. And you see here in verse 2, it says, with all lowliness and gentleness, with long suffering, bearing with one another in love, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now, verse 2 there is talking about some crucial attitudes that will come into our life for growth. If we want to grow, by God's grace, these are the things we're going to have to look at. And first of all, there's an attitude towards self. And what is that? Well, it says there lowliness, lowliness, you know, and gentleness. What's it talking about? It's talking about personal humility. And then it talks about our relationship with others and how this, how's that going to play out? Well, it talks about being long suffering. Now, if you've ever been in a relationship, you know that there's long suffering. I mean, that's part of what a relationship is sometimes, is that there are painful parts of that. There are difficult things that we go through, and he talks about bearing with one another in love. Now, what that means in a nutshell is you have to put up with me. That's what it means. In love, you have to put up with me. And guess what? I have to put up with you. That's what it means. And as I can look at those things, I say, well, I don't know whose job is harder, but I know God's job is really the hardest of all. Why? Because he has to put up with all of us in love. And he does. And he's teaching us by example in that. What a patient and loving and graceful God we have. And he talks there in verse 3 about endeavoring. You know what the word endeavor means? It means to have an ongoing effort, something that you don't just do once and say, well, I did that. No, he says, this is going to be something that we get to do over and over and over again. And he's talking about endeavoring to keep the bond of peace. Now, thinking about it here as a, a church, this is an important thing because what it, it shows us is that we're, we have something worth keeping. Uh, whenever you have something and, and someone says, here, keep this, what does it mean? It means something of value. And so you have God's word here saying there's something very, very valuable that God has given us which is a bond of peace, a unity of the spirit. And it doesn't say, try to create this, you know, try to uh, manufacture this. No, he says, I've given it to you. Your job is to endeavor to keep it, to hold on to that which I have given you. And Proverbs 6.19, if you write it down and just think about it and maybe look at it later, Proverbs 6.19 it's talking about things that God hates. And I don't want to be involved in anything that God hates. But one of the things that he says is, I hate when somebody sows discord among the brethren. What's he saying there? Somebody who doesn't endeavor to keep this. And so God's goal for us is, is a unity, a love, a common bond there in Christ. And again, that is not the way the world is naturally. I mean, when you really look at it, divisions divide people all the time. Differences, you know, if, if somebody's a different color or culture or whatever else, then everyone says, all right, that's it. That's a division. I want nothing to do with that. But God has given us a commonality in Christ that we need to sometimes let go of some of those divisions that maybe would have divided us in the past. But he says, you know what, you'll grow into it. How do we do that? through the common bond of the Spirit. You see that in verse 4. It says, There is one body, one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. Now, when I used to live in Texas, that would have been there read at the end, and in y'all. That would have been one of those differences that can sometimes divide. you know. But what he's talking about there in those verses Key word, you may have noticed it, it's one. He keeps saying it over again. One body, one spirit, one hope, one love, one faith, one Lord. All of these things. Seven times that word is used in just those few verses. And notice this. In those verses, what's it, what is it talking about? It's talking about the one God in the three persons. This is really cool. If you look at verse 4, it says the spirit. One spirit. Then you go to... Verse 5, and it talks about one Lord, and it's referring there to Jesus. And then you see verse 6, it says, one Father of all. That's there, the triune God. And it's really 
amazing, I believe, God even beyond our understanding, but certainly one of the things he wanted us to understand is the necessity of unity. Even as you see there, God, the triunity of God in that passage. And it's important to see that unity is not the same thing as uniformity. See, again, sometimes people get confused on this when it comes to Christianity and say, oh, well, if you'd really grow up to be a Christian, you're going to look a certain way and you're going to be something externally. But notice it doesn't say anything here like one hairstyle, one musical preference, one favorite food. We're going to be exactly identical. Not at all. See, it's talking there about a unity that is for the internal and the eternal things. Those are the things that really have us all in common. I don't know if all of us with all our different backgrounds and all the different things that are going on would be sitting in one room together tonight if not for one thing, which is the one God that we all share in common. And I think it's great to remember that one heaven will be there. There will not be little compartments in heaven. You know, it's one heaven for all Christians. And we're all headed there. And the same faith, that's what he's talking about, the same faith, the same Lord, the same grace of the same God is what's going to get us to there. And I think it's really difficult sometimes to believe how many believers can't seem to get along when they still say they have the same Lord. See, when you think about it, my kids, part of what I do in our house is make sure that there's a unity of peace in the kids, right? Sometimes there can be sibling rivalry. Sometimes they're uh, apt to let those differences divide them. And one of the things I do is I say, hey, listen, if you're going to get along with dad, you've got to get along with each other. And dad's going to make sure that you get along with each other. And that's one of the things that goes on there, that it's not really possible to say, well, hey, Lord, I love you, but I don't like your kids very much. You know, I can't stand all the people around. Uh, I get along great with God, but not with anyone else. But that's really not possible, because if we're walking in the spirit, well, if we have the same spirit within, then we can work those things out. Now, you see in verse 7, it says, to each one of us, grace was given. It comes back to this again. Grace was given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Now, what this shows us is that every single Christian has been given a great big gift to grow into. What you see there is grace given according to the measure of Christ's gift. Well, that's pretty large, right? How big is that gift? How big is the measure of Christ's gift? Well, I, I would say that it goes beyond understanding even. But that's where it comes to say that you will grow into it. See, I find that to be a fascinating idea that it's saying, hey, God's been giving you a huge gift. And he's going to also give you the gift of growing into that, growing into that stature there of Christ. And again, I remind you that grace picks up the pace. When we come to understand that it's God working within us and we can have a surrender to the spirit and there's things that we can actually do to co-labor with him, to surrender to him, to actually increase our ability to grow. The same way that people can do that in a physical sense, yes, there are things that God has given us as very clear paths to growing spiritually. You can't do it by trying harder, that's for sure, but you can do it by trusting him and obeying the things that he talks about here. Now, verse 8, it says, therefore he says, it's talking about the Holy Spirit there, it says, when he ascended on high, he led captivity captive and gave gifts to men. The picture being painted there in verse 8, it's an important word to understand as he's giving these things out. It's that of a conquering military hero. If in those days there was a guy who would uh, conquer an army, well, at the end of that, he would share the spoils with the army that, that was on his side. And that's what you see happening there, dividing the spoil with the troops. And, and the picture is Jesus conquering at the cross all of the enemies spiritually that we face and saying, hey, now I'm giving the spoils to you. I'm giving the gifts to you. And so that's salvation and all that goes with it. And there is much that goes with it. You see there in verse 9 and 10, interesting parenthesis here. It says, now this, he ascended. What does it mean? but that he also first descended into the lower parts of the earth. He who descended is also the one who ascended far above all the heavens, that he might fill all things. Now, you might right there be saying ascended, descended. What in the world does that have to do with growing in grace or anything else? Well, every once in a while, Paul, uh, well, he, he's a guy who can uh, 
cause you to put your thinking cap on. You have to actually pay attention to what he's saying here. And I'll paraphrase verse 9 and 10 this way. Jesus made a round trip. Jesus made a round trip. And what he's saying there is he ascended. Yes, that's true, but that means he had to first descend. What did he descend in? Well, you think of it this way. He's the eternal God, the Bible says, started out on the throne there, and he descended. He humbled himself. He became a man. And not only became a man, but became a man who went to a sinner's death. And he went to the tomb there, and he ascended after that back to the place of prominence. Now, why did he take that round trip? Why did he do that? Well, Paul gives us the reason right there. Why did he go from the throne to the tomb and back to the throne? Why did he do that? Was there something accomplished in that? Well, yes, that's what he says, that in that process, he gave us gifts, a gift that we could grow into. And that, that gift, first of all, is that salvation but it's also the sanctification that we've talked about, the growth process. And you see verse 11, it says, He himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Now, back in verse 7, you may have noticed it said that he gave all believers a gift of grace. But here in verse 11, it says there's some specifics. There's some who have some, some specific gifts by God's grace. And so... This is important for us to realize what he's talking about here because he says God gave all Christians great grace. But there are people that he's placed in the church body for a specific purpose there, and all Christians are saved for service. I think this is really important. Pedro emphasizes it all the time, and I want to do that again tonight, which is that every Christian is in full-time Christian service. Every believer is a minister. And you see still, though, that there are some places that God has in the body for specifics. And it talks there about apostles and prophets, and it talks about evangelists, and it talks about pastors and teachers. And Pedro's already gone through the book of Ephesians, and I don't want to elaborate on things that have already been discussed. You can always get those out of our lending library. But you see him talking about something that I really want to emphasize, which is pastors and teachers. See, there's a lot of different things there, but one of the things that we're talking about tonight is you'll grow into it. And he says that he places people in our lives for a reason. And it's for the equipping of the saints. You see that in verse 12. And that those people who are, sometimes we'll say, oh, that guy's really gifted. He's a really gifted evangelist. You know, what we're recognizing there is that God has given a gift for a specific purpose. Think of someone like Greg Laurie who came here, Billy Graham who came here. Very gifted evangelists. But you know what? Those guys are just normal guys who God gave a gift to. And you know what? By giving them a gift, he also gave them as a gift. This is the key that I want us to pay close attention to. He gave a gift to them, but he gives a gift through them to us. See, Greg Laurie is a gift to the body of Christ. And I think about this. Pastor Pedro, a great friend of mine, and I can see very clearly, I hope you can too, he has a gift of evangelism. Not only a great teacher, but he is a person who God has specifically gifted, I believe, in evangelism. And just a, a guy who has a real heart and ability God-given to do that. Now, thinking about it, evangelism isn't the end of the story. And that's why it's great that a church body has many, many different parts and pieces and that's when you see that somebody, let's say Billy Graham comes to town, and he does a crusade, and it's like, wow, someone got saved. This is great. There's a lot of growing to do. See, when Lourdes has that fourth baby, I don't know if this is fourth and final. Though we'll have to talk about that later. But if, if she has that fourth baby. They know from the other three, the process is not over. I mean, it, it's a little bit challenging, of course, to have a baby, but... Raising a child is a whole process, too. There's so much to that. And so that's what it's an understanding of, is saying, hey, yes, God will give a gift maybe to someone who can be like that doctor who's there as an OBGYN, and, and that baby is born there. But there's also pediatric care, and there's so much after the fact there. And you're seeing him saying that that's God's gift. Now, 
My role here is as a pastor teacher, and especially tonight, that's what I'm doing. And you know what that means? I am God's gift to you. That's what that means. <laughs> now, some of you are saying, did you keep the receipt? Because I would like to take you back. But here's the thing. Think about it this way. We like to think of our role this way here as a coach. How many Heat fans have we got here? Anybody watching? Some fair weather fans, especially now that they're doing great, of course. But uh, you know what? This is, a, this is just true in each sport. Everyone knows this, that a coach is not the best player for every position and, in fact, may not be the best player in any position except as the coach. And you think about this, his role or her role is to help each player play at their maximum potential in their position, their specific position. It's not for the coach to go out there and grab the ball and start trying to do things with it, although sometimes they look like they want to. But you think about this, the coach of the Heat, right? If he were to play Dwayne Wade one-on-one, -on -one, who do you think would win? Would you say, oh, well, you know, the coach knows a lot about basketball, though. If Shaq were to go up to the foul line and, and shoot a shot, do you think the coach could do Well, that's not a good example. But, <laughs> but you know what I'm saying, that ordinarily a coach, not necessarily better than any player in any position, but his position is to help every player play their maximum potential and play as a team. That's the whole idea there, and that's what God is saying here. In the same way he gave pastors and evangelists and apostles and prophets and all these different things. It says he gave some to be that, not everybody. And so the thing to remember, though, is that every Christian is called to full-time service somewhere. You just have a different mission field. Our mission field is you, and your mission field is the world. That's what we're seeing here in verse 12. It says, for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry. It says, for the edifying of the body of Christ till we all, that's all of us, Come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And that's a great phrase to think about. The equipping of the saints. Now, who are the saints? Well, it's the people in stained glass, right? Not at all. The saints are the people in the seats in the church who are walking worthy in their lives, training for your service. See, that's what we're doing. We're training you for your service. This is our service, and we're training you for yours. And it's a great promise for God, from God, which is that God has a specific role for each and every Christian. He's given grace to you for your specific mission. And you know what? You will grow into it. That's what's great. Right now, you may say, I don't even know what it is. Well, that's part of the growth process. God wants to mature you and grow you up and grow you into areas of service. That's what Paul talks about in Ephesians 2, 8 through, through 10. If you look at that later, it, he says there, you are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works. Not by good works, not because of anything you've done, but God wants to do great and exciting and wonderful works through your life. That's the worthy walk. It's not walking worthy to earn God's favor. It's that you have been given God's favor as a gift, and he wants to now use those gifts to bless other people. And so, again, I remind you, you're the main missionaries of this church. We all enter the mission field when we leave here. There's a sign that I really like at some churches. We may get it here someday, but it's right at the exit gate, and it says, you are now entering the mission field. And I love that reminder as we're exiting the property to say, Hey, that's the reason we came. That's part of the reason we came, was to grow up, to grow into the things that God has for us. What does it mean? It means that tomorrow you can run your business with integrity, even when everyone else around you doesn't. That is walking worthy. It's doing your job with joy when everyone else doesn't. That's walking worthy. See, it's sharing your faith with your friends and your family just in the practical things. That's walking worthy of the calling that we have. And when someone comes to you maybe for advice, rather than giving them worldly wisdom, maybe you can give them some word wisdom because we've equipped you and are equipping you in the things of God, hopefully being faithful to our call so you can be faithful to yours because it's so important to see that's what God's purpose for the church is, raising your kids to love the Lord. See, we can 
teach them in children's ministry, and maybe even some of you teach in children's ministry. But the real ministry so often happens in all the hours that you're not here, but there at home, walking worthy, living your life with freedom and joy and peace and all the things that God wants in our lives. And what's his growth chart? I don't know if you have one of these at home, but we had them for the kids where we charted their growth against the uh, door frame. My parents actually growing up had one in the house and they actually took the door with them when they moved, you know, because it was such a sentimental thing that they didn't want to get rid of the door. So they have the door with them there. But God's growth chart, what is it there in our lives? Verse 13, it says, the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Wow, that ought to take a lifetime. Yeah, it will. The Son of God, he's our big brother in the growth chart. Wow, you look at it and you say, hmm, I've got a ways to grow. Yes, but we will grow into it. And that's what he says in verse 14, that we would no longer be children, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the trickery of men, by the cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. In the scriptures, we clearly see that Jesus said, unless you become like a little child, you won't enter the kingdom of heaven. And what he was saying there is we're to be childlike, but not childish. See, childish is all the things about kids that, that are not good, the immaturity and all of those things, the selfishness sometimes. and Those things, that, well, that's childish. But childlike, that's the trust and the faith and all the things that we love about kids. And so he's saying there, you know what? We don't, we don't want to be childish, no longer children. Kids are really fickle. I don't know if you've noticed this as a parent, as you're trying to plan maybe for a birthday or something and you're trying to figure out what it is they want and it changes from day to day. There's like one day where they've got it all circled in the catalog and, and I just can't live without this doll or whatever else or this little thing. And then you get it for them and it's right to the bottom of the toy box. It's like you couldn't live without that thing and now you don't even know where it is. And so often, again, the emotional, whoa, roller coaster that they're just laughing one second, crying the next, and all the rest of that. And aren't you so glad that we're never like that as adults now? Now we've really grown up and grown out of that. But of course, we still struggle with these things. But you know what? The point of the church is to train and to teach saints, all of us, as we're all doing that learning. Hey, you know what? Part of the great thing about this, the thing to remember is, Pastor Pedro, he's growing into it. All the rest of the people here, we're growing into it. I mean, it's not like we know what we're doing all the time. We say, Lord, by your grace, we're growing into it. As the church is growing, we're growing into it. And we're learning as we go. And you see those things, though, that Pastor Pedro very well taught the folks here. Not prone to being blown. I've seen that as a church. It's one of the reasons we were really attracted to the place here because I knew that Pastor Pedro was well-grounded in those things and wanting people to be spiritually stable like that, not just kind of letting anything go from this pulpit. And You know what's great about that is part of growing up and part of being a parent is teaching someone not only what is edible but what is inedible, what is good, what is bad. And so can I get this practical as we think about, again, the church growing and different things and how are we going to grow as individuals? Well, one of the things that we base our beliefs and our practices on here at Calvary Chapel Kindle is, is kind of a three-pronged test that's a, an age-old thing that the church has put into practice for many, many years. And, you know, so many people just abandon it so quickly, especially in our modern day. But this is what it was. If we're going to practice something, if we're going to do it, we need to be able to check these three things, which is, was it taught by Jesus in the Gospels? Did Jesus teach it? If if he didn't teach us to do it, then we don't want to do it. If we don't want to just make up something because, it wow, it's, everyone's doing it. So Matthew to John, if we can't find Jesus teaching on it, well, then we don't really practice it as a doctrine. Practice by the church in Acts, that was the other thing. Didn't you see the first church there doing it? Well, is the first church doing it? No. Well, then why would we do it? And then you see being explained by the epistles, and we're looking at those tonight. Romans to Revelation, the rest of the New Testament. Hey, if it wasn't taught by Jesus, practiced by the church, and explained by the apostles, it's not part of the foundation of our faith. And so he's saying there a lot of times when someone's childish, 
they're blown by every wind of doctrine. Hey, something exciting is happening over there. And everyone goes toward that. And then they go back the other way and all of that sort of thing. And things come and go, but those kind of things don't help you grow really at the end of the day. What helps us grow? The things that Jesus taught, the things that the church practiced, and the things that the apostles explained to us. You see, that protecting us from every wind of doctrine. And it's not just that we would believe right. The thing is, what we believe is how we'll behave. See, if we believe a lie, we will live a lie. And Jesus said, hey, the truth is what sets you free. So it's so important for our, us to be growing spiritually in our knowledge of the word of God. And damaging doctrines do blow through the church all the time. And they toss people to and fro, and unfortunately, they hurt many lives. And so as you think about that, there may be a lot of side-to-side -side motion, but there's not a lot of growth in those things. And I think of it this way. I grew up in Colorado a big part of my life, and we didn't have hurricanes there, but we didn't have these things that were these tremendous winds that would just come out of nowhere. And I lived right at the base of a, of a mountain, and it would come over the mountain and just really be going even up to the hundreds, uh, you know, 100 miles an hour of wind. And I used to have to walk to school. Um, it was uphill both ways. And uh, then, you know, about through 10 feet of snow and all that kind of thing. That's what I tell the kids anyway. And we had these huge coats, and they're down coats. Uh, we don't get much use for those here. Every once in a while, I'll go to an outlet mall down here and see one and think, hmm, that must be for people who are going to travel. But you, you see these coats, and they were huge. So here you've got this parka on, and I'm just a little kid walking to school like I had to in the snow and the freezing weather and all the rest. And the wind one day just picked me up, just threw me all the way down the street. And I lost my homework, unfortunately. It went everywhere. It went all over. I told it like this, just to the teacher and to my mom, and, and they all believed it. But it is true. I really did. I lost my homework. It went flying. Uh, most of it was wrong answers, but at least it went away. And the thing about that is today, it would take a whole lot stronger wind to blow me away. Now, that's not to say that some wind couldn't come and do that. But you know what? When you grow, there's something about the stability that happens with that. And that's what he's talking about here, that it, you would no longer be just back and forth and all over the place, but stable in your life, spiritually stable, where you start saying, you know what? When the winds howl and blow in my life, there's an anchor, and that anchor is Christ. And you see in verse 14, he talks about trickery, cunning craftiness, deceitful plotting. I mean, those are some pretty strong words coming out of Paul's mouth there. And what he's showing us is that, you know what, we need to learn to discern. We need to be people who, who know that there are some people out there who will manipulate people. And the very thing that makes a church such a beautiful place of God's grace also makes it kind of a dangerous place sometimes. One of the things I've noticed here is sometimes parents, they just let their kids, you know, go crazy. And it's like, ah, we're at church. You know, what could happen? What could happen? Well, things could happen. And you think about, you know, all of the different things where we, we have people sometimes leave their purses. I don't know. There's, a, I think, a purse right there in the front row. But uh, if people leave their purses laying around sometime. And you would never do that at the movies. You'd never go to the movies and leave your purse on the seat and go away for three hours and come back and expect it to be there. And you go, well, we're just all Christians here, right? No, you know, if you're a thief here tonight, uh, <laughs> we're keeping our eye on you. We know whose purse that is. So... But just thinking about that, he's saying, hey, Satan wants to do so much more than steal your purse. You know, he, he wants to steal your joy and your life and your relationships and everything else. And he says, we got to grow up some that we would not be like a little kid. See, part of being a parent, you hate for your kids to lose their innocence, don't you? But a big part of it is you realize kids will embrace sometimes anybody and you have to teach them, hey, that's a stranger. That's a family member. You know, the difference between those types of things and learning to discern. And so you see verse 15, it says, speaking the truth in love, you may grow up. See, this is what Paul's talking about, that you may grow up in all things into him who is the head. That's Christ, from whom the whole body joined and knit together by what every joint supplies, according to the effective working by which every part does its share causes growth of the body for the edifying of itself in love. Now, I think about this at our house. 
uh, when the kids were babies, they did not have chores. They didn't have any responsibility. They're just supposed to sit there and look cute. You know, that's, that's all they did. But as they've grown up, and they're maybe not quite as cute, I mean, no offense, Stephen, but you know, and when they're real little, ever, oh, they're so cute, you know, but then they grow up and it's, all right, well, time to, you know, get some chores. And so, <laughs> as kids mature, it's part of the growing process, isn't it? And you know what, sometimes it really, it, it really does take longer to teach a kid to clean their own room than it does just to clean their own form. But it's part of the growth process. And so he's saying there, every part doing its share. And it's something for us to remember as we look at that. Just saying, hey, Lord, what is my place here? Part of our mission statement, our, our uh, you know, the acronym for the church here is life. And, and a big part of that is the finding of your fit. Finding your fit of, of how your gifts that God has given you can be given to others here. And one of the things that happens in that is it does grow you up. Because generally, God doesn't call the equipped. He equips the call. He says, all right, you're going to do this. Oh, I don't know how to do it. Well, that's why I'm going to grow you through that. And so you see him there saying, hey, every part doing its share. So important. And then you see the edifying of itself, the building up of the body. See, this is so great because you're probably sitting close to somebody, somebody's near you, and you know what's a great thing to do is to pray for other people that they would understand this. Why? Because it's to your benefit if the person sitting next to you or near you grows in Christ. And you know what? It's to their benefit if you do. If we're all growing together, it's to our benefit. It's to the blessing of the body and really to the blessing of the Lord and to the blessing of the world if we will grow in maturity. And you see it there in verse 17. It says, This I say, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that you should no longer walk as the rest of the Gentiles walk in the futility of their mind, having their understanding darkened and being alienated from the life of God. And he goes on to talk about the hardness of heart there. And one of the things that's funny about walking, we're talking about walking worthy, but you cannot simultaneously walk in two directions. I don't know if you've ever tried that, but it's a great way to fall. Uh, but you're either going to walk one way or another. And he's saying there, there was a way that you used to walk. Don't walk that way anymore. You've got to walk the other way. That's what it is to walk worthy, is to follow the call, the upward call of Christ. And so he's talking there about all of these different things and the hardness of heart and that can go on. But he says in verse 20, that's not what you've learned in Christ. If indeed you have heard him and been taught by him as the truth is in Jesus. And so what is he going to teach us? Well, we're seeing it there in verse 22, 23, 24. It talks about that garment. It talks about putting on and putting off. And again, tonight's theme, thinking about it, you'll grow into it. But you know what? It's also a truth that you'll grow out of it or you need to grow out of it. There's areas that we all need to grow out of things and say, no, that's really part of my past. That's not part of my now. That's not part of my future. That's part of my past. That's part of the past that God has taken away from me. And I don't want to walk that way anymore. You see him saying, just put it off concerning your former conduct, verse 22, the old man which grows corrupt. Isn't that interesting? Yeah, it grows corrupt. Oh, that's the wrong type of growth according to the deceitful lust, and be renewed in the spirit of your mind that you put on the new man which was created according to God in true righteousness and holiness. Now, if you spend any time around kids, you'll know every kid wants to grow. I've never met a kid who, who doesn't want to get a little older. You know, they always round up. It's, how old are you? Well, I'm nine and, you know, 212 days or something. And they're, well, why? Because they want to grow. And they're always trying to stand up a little straighter when you put the thing on, you know, well, my hair is sticking up. I can, you know, I, I'm almost this much. And if a person has no desire to grow whatsoever spiritually, no hunger to do that, in a way you have to say, well, man, growth is life. And if, if I have no desire to grow spiritually and no, no passion for that, I need to check my pulse and say, you know what, life, Lord, you came to give it to me. And... Without growth, really, there is no life. And so he's talking there about putting off and putting on, growing out of it and growing into it. And you know what? With our kids close, we, we are amazed how quickly they grow out of it, how quickly it becomes a hand-me-down or a throw-it-out, you know? 
And so we have to go through this process as parents where we clean out the closet and we say, oh, that is just done. You can't wear that anymore. And every once in a while they have a favorite shirt or something that just isn't happening anymore. You know, it's, but I like this one. And yeah, but it's three sizes too small. You know, it's just no longer yours. And so he's saying that's stuff you've outgrown. And I don't know if you, what, what they called it when you were growing up, but high water pants. You know, now they have them capris and it's, uh, it's style, you know. But when I was growing up, if your ankle was showing, you had high waters. <laughs> I mean, that's just the way it was. And that was not a desirable thing. You were outgrowing your pants, you know. It's time to do something about it. And so he says there, there are things in our life that are just going to be outgrown, that we need to get past that. You know, where Paul said, when I was a kid, I thought like a kid and I acted like a kid. But, you know, now that I'm maturing in Christ, there's some things that I'm putting behind me. And verse 22, he talks about some very practically deceitful lusts. And it's interesting there because what he's telling us is lust lies. It's deceitful. It says, hey, indulge me and I'll leave you alone. But you know what? Lust is very deceitful because the more you feed it, the more it wants. See, sin likes to grow too. Uh, righteousness is to grow in our life, you know. But sin loves to grow too. The same way that in your garden maybe you have weeds that seem to grow on their own and then you've got flowers that you want to grow and you have to tend them a little bit more. But the weeds seem to come out of nowhere and they love to grow. And so you see them saying, hey, give me a little fuel, I'll leave you alone. That's what lust says. But it's not true. It says we have to be renewed in the spirit of our mind and walk worthy of the calling and grow in the grace of God. And you'll see all the way through that it's a choice. It's a choice that we face. We have to be willing. God will give us the power if we are willing. And you see verse 25, it says, putting away lying. Putting away lying. Let each of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. I read an article just this week. Maybe you saw it, and if you didn't, you might tell me you did, even though you didn't, because it said that people lie more than they admit. People would be interviewed, and they, they had experiments where they interviewed people. Hey, you know, do you lie? Well, very rarely, you know, or whatever. And then they went through, and they taped all the different things that they said, and they taped interactions with them. And even right there, they were lying in the, in the experiments, and they said they didn't. You know, they just weren't even aware of it. It becomes a habit for so many. And you see that the Bible says that the lies are the native tongue of Satan. When we're lying, we're speaking his language and doing things his way. And Revelation 21.8 even says, hey, liars go to the lake of fire. I think that's where liar, liar, pants on fire came from. But it, it says, hey, you're hanging from a telephone wire. But just thinking about lies. You know, what he's saying here is part of the growth process is to start telling the truth and not lying. And there's a lot of different ways to lie, of course. There's the half-truth. You know, but that's still a whole lie. There's the exaggeration. This one's a big one. You know, if, if Pedro asked, well, how many people were there tonight? I don't know, 1,500, <laughs> give or take. I, I'm not very good at counting. I don't know, somewhere in there. But I think about a guy who, I saw a shirt, and it had all these sports, uh, different figures on it, and it says, the older I get, the better I was. And what he's saying there is that in our own memory, it's like all of a sudden, Man, we were first round draft potential, if not for that ankle injury. But the truth was, you were the water boy and you were cut from the team for not filling the little, you know, Gatorade thing on time. But it's like our mind begins to fill in the gaps sometimes. The lies of silence, which is just letting someone come to the wrong conclusion when you know the right thing, but you just don't say anything. And then there's the little white lie again. Oh, well, it's just a little one. But again, they grow. They like to grow. How would it affect you if you realized that Jesus told little white lies in the gospel? You know, like it said, hey, your mom's outside. And they said, tell him I'm not here. You go, wait a minute. Tell him I'm not here. Jesus, you can't do that. Well, it's just a little white lie. See, lies always trip us up. I think of this story, I really like it. It's a man who came into a meat market and he asked for the biggest chicken they had. And the butcher, they were running low on stock and he knew he only had one chicken left. One chicken left, but he wanted to make the sale. So the guy says, I need a three pound chicken. The guy came back and out from the freezer and he brought the chicken and he said, here, it's three pounds. He said, oh, wait, wait, wait. 
No, I need a little more than that. And he says, okay, well, I'll be right back. And he came back out and he said, here, this one's four pounds. He brought the same chicken, you know. And the guy said, great, I'll take them both. <laughs> See, it's, it's amazing how you can really get in trouble with that. But you see in verse 25, he talks about the motive. He says, don't lie to one another. Why? We're part of the same body. Can you imagine if your body lied to itself? I mean, think about this. Your eye sees very clearly that you can't clear it, but it says, it's all right. You can make it. Bang! You know? <laughs> Why did you lie to me? You're part of the same body. The whole body suffers when one part of the body is not truthful with the other. And he's, again, so practical in here. Isn't this great? I mean, he's talked all this theology in the first part of it, but he says, hey, this is what the worthy walk's going to look like. You're going to know God's grace is flowing in your life when you can do this. He says, verse 26, be angry and do not sin. Don't let the sun go down on your wrath. Do not give place to the devil. See, anger is one of those things that really can take such a foothold there. And he's saying, you know what? Don't go to sleep mad. Now, my wife and I have kind of a rule at our house, which is we don't go to sleep mad. Now, sometimes that means we don't go to sleep, you know. <laughs> but there's a time where eventually just fatigue wins out. All right, forgive me. I'm sorry. You know, but he, he's saying there, don't let the layers form. Don't let resentment and bitterness grow in these things. That's part of growing is not letting the bad stuff grow out of control. Now, you see verse 28, he says, let him who stole steal no longer. That, I'm talking about that purse there in the front row. But rather, let him labor, working with his hand what is good, that he may have something to give him who has a need. Isn't that amazing? He says, work harder so you can have more for yourself. No, it says, so you might actually have some left to give, to be a giving person, because that's part of growth. See, giving is part of growth. When kids learn actually to give instead of take, you know, when they're excited about gifts that they're giving somebody else rather than all the gifts they're getting, that's part of maturing. And then he says in verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but only what's good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. It'd be a pretty quiet world in a way if this is all anyone did. It's a, is this for necessary edification? Is this going to impart grace to whoever hears it? Very important things to think about. And so often we think we can't control our tongue, but you know, we can. We do have a choice. It's funny because you know this firsthand because you can be out in the car going, blah, 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 and you get here, hallelujah. And you, what, what happened? Well, I, I changed it, you know? And so with that help, God can do that in our lives. <coughs> Let's read down through and close it out with verse 30, 31, 32. It talks about not grieving the Holy Spirit by whom we were sealed for the day of redemption. What's that showing? Well, just because you're grieving doesn't mean he's going to leave you. But it is a word that says, ow. It's like the Lord saying, oh, that, that hurts. Uh, that, that's, oh, that grieves me, sorrow. And so sin will stunt our growth because it's the grace of God that gives growth. So if we're grieving the very Holy Spirit who's going to give us the strength and power and motive for growth, then grieving him is going to stunt our growth. And you see verse 31, it says, let all bitterness and wrath and anger and clamor and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice and be kind to one another, tender hearted, tender hearted, forgiving one another, even as God in Christ forgave you. What's he saying there? Grow into it. Grow into the character of Christ. Walk worthy of your calling. All that God has done for you and done in you Begin to do it for others. And he's saying, you know, even in the body of Christ, there's going to be some hurt that's going to come your way. And he says, in that, you know, we're going to be close to one another. Chances are good oftentimes that it's our very friends who can turn into enemies. Why? Because they're close enough to hurt us. Everyone else is so far away that they were really indifferent to them. But, you know, he's saying there as we're close together as a body, we have to be able to forgive and to move on. And he's saying, you know what, you'll grow into it. Big growth. He's saying, I'm going to take you from being a liar to being a truth teller, from being a troublemaker to being a peacemaker, from being someone who takes to someone who gives, from someone who tra talks trash to someone who is imparting grace when they speak. And that's a very large gap in our lives. And that's why I conclude by saying, you know what, I can't do it. It comes back to the same thing, trusting or trying. 
Well, it's not about trying harder. It's about trusting him that he will do it. When we say, I can't, he can. And every command of God comes with the power to perform it, the power to obey it. And so as we're walking that worthy walk, we're going to wobble just like that toddler. We're going to take some falls. But just remember the encouragement of Ephesians that God is not there to push us or trip us or anything else. He just says, hey, come to me and walk worthy. And you know what? We'll all grow into it. Father, thank you for this opportunity we have tonight to grow by your grace, to think about the things that your word says to us. And maybe there are certain areas of this teaching that were specifically for me, maybe for different people in this room. Lord, some area where we need some growth, some place that you wanted to put your finger and say, that's it right there. I want to grow you up in that area. I know right now the garment seems awfully big and it looks pretty unlikely that you would grow into that. But Lord, I pray that you would give us the strength to grow as a body, not just numerically, but spiritually, Lord, deep, so that we individually would be able to say that we have found our fit and we are missionaries and we are accomplishing our mission in you. Thank you for that. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen.